Uh, it's, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much for being with us uh, tonight. It's a pleasure, a privilege and a joy for me to be able to welcome Simon Alford to deliver uh, tonight's lecture. An exciting uh, climax to what has been an extraordinarily rich and varied programme of around 90 academic events across all periods, practices and disciplines this year at the British School at Rome. Uh, Simon is a man who needs no introduction as one of the four uh, founding partners of Alford Hall Monaghan Morris, a company which is experiencing phenomenal uh, success in recent years. The recognition that AHMM are rightly uh, currently receiving is uh, truly breathtaking. Prizes and awards are, of course, uh, one measure of success, uh, but we at the British School of Rome have been uh, delighted to observe how AHMM have been decorated this year alone with the RIBA South Award for Barnes Road, the RIBA London Awards for three projects, shortlisting for Practice of the Year, Building of the Year, Client's Choice, and finishing a spectacular fourth in the AJ100 rankings for uh, 2017. Just uh, to pick out a few of their successes to give you a flavor of the esteem in which they are held. Uh, I can't go through a stock check of the AHMM trophy cabinet as the full inventory of accomplishments uh, and awards would take up so much time that Simon would not be left any for his talk. But it is worth mentioning also, of course, as you will know, that they won uh, the prestigious Sterling Prize for Burntwood Hall in Wandsworth in 2015. Tonight uh, is a very special occasion. We have uh, Simon with, with us, and we have him with us to launch AHMM's new exhibition, which we are uh, extremely uh, privileged to be staging in the adjacent gallery next door. An exhibition exploring the essential architecture of the universal building. It's an exhibition which uh, focuses principally on the, how their approach is manifest in six different projects, in projects with very diverse uh, physical, political, cultural and incidental contexts. The contexts of London, Amsterdam, New York and India. The exhibition probes the art of an extraordinary architecture pioneered by AHMM's four founding fathers in their diploma thesis at the Bartlett in the 1980s, in which they stated that function alone is not sufficient means to generate architecture, and that it is in the field of everyday buildings that architecture has failed the city. I would like to uh, acknowledge on behalf of the British School at Rome our gratitude to AHMM for their kindness as one of a number of uh, supporters of the BSR and, their, and our uh, renowned architecture programme. Architecture uh, has been a central plank of our mission since the doors uh, first swung open of this building over 100 years ago, with our first award holder being an architect himself, a Canadian, instigating a tradition of great architects supported by this extraordinary institution. A tradition which, uh, with the generosity of the likes of AHMM, continues to flourish. Um, Simon, thank you very much uh, for being here. We're thrilled to have you with us uh, because your architecture is at the cutting edge of the, uh, the intelligent, the practical, the innovative and the challenging and also thrilled uh, because you are a much uh, valued friend of the British School at Rome. Uh, please all join me in extending a very warm welcome to Simon Alford. Uh, good evening, it's very nice to be here. Marina said we're um, 20 minutes late, so I must keep to Roman time and we'll talk for no, no more than two hours. Um, uh, it's very nice to be here. My partners and I are kind of pleased to, to be involved in supporting the um, British School at Rome. I think it's fascinating for us to come to a city like this because our interest since we studied together in the early 80s has been in the kind of tension, creative tension, between what we do, which is architects making buildings, 
and a place like Rome, which is a, a city where, in, in, despite having some fundamentally important buildings in the history of architecture, it's the city that kind of makes Rome most memorable to us all. When we were studying together as students, we produced this, at the time, high technology drawing using Xerox reproduction, and it was called Generic City, and it was playing with a Mondrian idea and Broadway boogie woogie, and thinking a little bit about plot size, adjacencies, um, how cities get a finer grain to the middle, how plot sizes grow to the edge. And it was a kind of attempt to make a drawing between us as a negotiation that represented an idea that we were interested in, in the role of architecture in making cities. I know Marina's programme here has talked about fragments, and obviously Rome is a place of kind of uh, aggregations of fragments, originally not always in fragmented pieces, but that's the kind of archaeology of the city. And to us, there's a sort of incidental history of architecture, which we'll talk a little bit about tonight, and which we tried to show in the exhibition, which is how architecture builds upon the place in which it is. Um, and as we said in the intro, um, to us, when we were students, and it's still true 30 years on, that whilst there's currently an interest in cultural buildings, um, and perhaps shape-making in architecture, to us there's a lack of interest in what we regard as the everyday. And to us the everyday is in fact the stock of the city. It is the most important thing. It's the thing that defines the streets and the squares that, that are the most memorable and permanent part. So for us it's an interest we've always had. We've worked on art galleries and other projects. But an interest to us is what are the buildings that people interface with? And interestingly, when you look at buildings, you know, we, as architects, engage with buildings. We help conceive them with clients in, 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 in different circumstances. Um, we then help other people build them. And then when we finish, and we talk about the end of a project, actually that's the beginning of a building's life. And for us, there's always been this interesting tension. What is our role in the life of a building after we've finished? And how can we design an architecture that responds to a life we don't yet know? Um, that brings us to that kind of great modernist debate about function and you know, form and function. And to us, it's very clear. If you take London is made of two cities, the city of London and the city of Westminster, Westminster has 10,000 listed buildings. These are buildings that cannot be changed. And yet, each, all of those buildings were called into being at least 100, maybe 500 years ago, and none of them were being used for the purpose for which they were designed. So in a sense, whilst we have clients, we don't make, we're not artists making projects on our own. We have clients who engage us to make what for them is an asset, it might be a cultural asset, it will definitely be a financial asset, whether public or private. But their brief is in some sense a kind of irrelevance and history proves that. And that's a tension that's fascinated us. Um, so we produced this book not long ago called Extraordinary and it was about that idea of how, as architects, you could be responsible to the city, responsible to your clients, and responsible to users who you don't yet know who will ha inhabit your buildings in ways you can't yet imagine. Um, I show this image. This is from the Royal Academy in London. I know you have a link up with the Royal Academy. This is John Soane's life work as uh, drawn by his kind of a draftsman, Joseph Gandhi. It's interesting in a way because we have been into some of those buildings. They're assembled as a sort of ad hoc uh, archaeological fragmented city. And at the same time, it emphasizes a point that the, the program of those buildings is architecture in the city. Not, we're not aware, when we look at that drawing, of any idea of function existing. Not that function didn't drive stone. He, he was successful because he actually addressed kind of uh, 19th century needs for new kinds of programs um, in, in an economical, uh, stripped back classical way. But there's this idea that actually the primary role of architecture is to, to present a face to the city because most of us won't visit the buildings that we walk past. Um, this image from Guy Debord is about 
you know, naked city, it's about psychogeography. Kevin Lynch talked about the fact that we all assemble different images of the city. And in a sense, to us, going back to that idea of Soane, if the architecture presents a face to the city, um, it also perhaps needs to mirror the city in that the buildings need to learn from the long-term success of the city. Streets come, you know, streets are permanent, buildings come and go. We are obsessed now with the fact that we live in a new technological age. Uh, when I was growing up, we were worried about a new ice age. Uh, we were worried about nuclear power. And uh, you know, we were worried about giving away our personal data. People would march for days on end to avoid giving away their personal data. We now live in a world where we're worried about global warming. Uh, nuclear power is apparently the solution. And all your data is known by everyone, and you're tracked everywhere you go. Um, so the world has always been a dynamic place, but now I think we're at the cusp of, of, a, of a, a kind of tension between kind of a new order, a new virtual world, a new mapping and knowledge. And yet, um, the fascination we have with the smart city is again mirrored through history. People only talk now about smart cities, mapping what you do, knowing how you move. But this is Louis Kahn, the great Louis Kahn, and his smart city was the car. So every age, the Industrial Revolution was an age of great change. Every age goes through dynamic change. And what's interesting is cities and the buildings within them still function. And in fact, you could argue that as technology shrinks, its relevance to physical form is actually ever less. Uh, this image really talks about regulation. This is Gilray's image from uh, 1787. This is the Bank of England, so it's the world doesn't change that much. This is the bankers of the Bank of England on their twice daily march down Fleet Street to control the populace of the UK. I think we still feel in a way, as designers, that we are caught between this idea of future uses, existing clients, and a dynamic regulatory world. Is that a problem? I think our view is not. And in fact, I think Charles Eames said, without constraint there's no design. And to us, actually, what we look to do with a project is draw out the very uh, great constraints that exist and utilise those as the kind of positive driver of how we might think about a more universal architecture. This is a familiar image to you more than it is to us. This is everyone's English uh, dream of a Tuscan hill town. Um, again, technology exists you know, in this town as it, you know, as it has for hundreds of years. It would define, defy any modern standards of hygiene, daylight, overlooking density. Anything you design now in that would be de de termed a slum, and yet it's a holiday home. And of course, it's a holiday home rather famous for the building of um, these, these celebrations at San Gimignano of the power of the great families, which again, in London, we're going through a debate about our skyline, should we allow change to occur? And yet here you see this, this idea of preservation versus a new world, the UNESCO World Heritage Site of San Gimignano, its very distinction comes from its skyline. So there are always lessons coming out of history. Our world is London, night and day. This is um, Osbert Lancaster's drawing. And to us, there's a thing about buildings allowing things to happen. But the, the interesting thing about cities is the things that happen that, that you don't control, the edginess. And this is a very interesting book because it doesn't talk about buildings or routes or things to visit. It talks about places where you can drink, party, uh, observe in a different kind of way. And that's a very important idea to us about the ordinary being special and extraordinary. Um, when we were young, many years ago, there were two competitions in this um, Midlands town in England. One was for an art gallery, it was won by friends of ours. Another was for a bus station. This is the bus station we designed 15 years on. To us, actually, the bus station was the public building. The art gallery was an important cultural building, but we were very interested in this idea of entering this idea of a, a bus station, how that could transform the kind of civic engagement within a place. Again, this idea of universal use, in Mises' case, it was an expression of a new vernacular. It was the industrialised world of Chicago that informed his architecture you know, to, to change and become this expression of 
of steel and glass and frame. But of course, Mies at the end of his lecture would say, but I did it like that because I liked the way it looked. And that's always this tension between the visual and the technological. Neither is the driver. This is a building we've worked on for the last 15 years, continuously. And um, it's a kind of uh, a cross that demonstrates the idea of the endless layering and changing of use behind the face of the building within the city. And to us then, this idea about program becomes a, a game between the specific and the generic. What is the difference between a university and a school, between a school and an office building, between an office building and an art gallery? How distinct are these real programs, or is it just the uh, decoration of the interior that distinguishes them? But while we're doing this and thinking about sameness and generic, we're also aware that the if a universal building could do anything for anyone, it's unlikely to do you know, anything of value for everyone because actually buildings need to have personality and character. How do you design personality and character? This is the Saatchi Gallery. Um, it was designed as an orphanage. It became a school. It became a territorial army centre and when we were asked to look at it, it was being turned into an office building. Which again is this, a demonstration of the idea of actually, uh, essentially well-formed and organised spaces can cope with a great variety of uses. So this every day to us, again this idea of the street and the inhabitation and the promenade that's more familiar to you perhaps than it is to us, although this is New York, um, the street is incredibly important to us, to the making of our buildings, because it's the one thing that we know within a building that will actually last beyond the functional programme. And of course there, there are generics. This is a, a scheme for 200 apartments in Oklahoma, in America, um, in this case built around a garage. But all we're doing here is exporting a European model of street address, of corner, where we've swallowed the car lot into the building rather than leaving it as a sort of detached, uh, burnt out uh, piece of city. This is a building that would be familiar to many of you. We've always liked this building since we were students because of the idea that before the war it was the Casa del Facio, after the war it's the Casa del Popolo. It's regardless of its political regimes that called into being, it remains a kind of <coughs> legendary essay in the architectural potential of the visage. Of course now, in this regulated world that Gilray drew earlier, this is a view of a new building we've just completed over Westminster Bridge Road. Um, this is a World Heritage Site and we get involved in kind of a global discussion about placing something new in a particular context. This context, this view, is only visible to a car passing by, but even in London, which would seem a place of dynamic vandalism compared to Rome, there is an obsession with uh, an, an order of, of keeping things as they are, and yet, in London, in the centre, over the last 40 years, 60% of the buildings have been demolished, but the streets remain. So when we make buildings, we try and think about the, the city rooms that define their entrance, and this is obviously Vasari's Passage and, uh, uh, and the Uffizi, an office building, which is of course a multi-purpose building, but to us the idea of how do you take those city rooms within a, a building, to kind of mirror the, the idea of city. Uh, this is uh, Nolly's plan, 1748. Revolutionary at the time, as it started thinking about not just the streets as the public realm, but the public spaces within it. What we find interesting now when we make new pieces of city, as we did at Stratford, um, which later became the Olympic Village, is we don't have in our new programs the communal use of uh, church. We have the communal use of street, and actually, to us at the moment, education has become the communal building of the, of, of the cities we are making. Uh, there's also an idea about how we design buildings. We, are, we like to design and deliver. We don't design and walk away. We are interested in, the, in, in the, the process all the way through. And of course, the more you build, the more the discipline of building feeds back in and either constrains your invention or informs it. This is Jean Prouvé's um, building, completely reconfigurable, completely handmade, but you know, with a machine-like uh, precision and aesthetic. But there's this kind of interesting idea that most of what we do, we are designing something and then finding something else and adapting it to accommodate an architecture that we, we've um, suggested. 
And increasingly, I think we've become more interested in, in how actually finding out the ways available to make buildings might then generate our architecture, this kind of tension of a flow back across time. Um, I know as part of the programme here, it, it's about architecture, art, the city and culture. And there's an interesting uh, tension which you'll see throughout the projects which you show in a minute, which are really talking about the, the placing of art in buildings, how we engage with artists, and our general experience has always been there's an interesting discussion, but it is much healthier and, and more powerful when the artist remains independent from the commission, um, but reacts to a place that they find. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright designed the, Lark designed the Larkin building in Buffalo, which is a great uh, void, the first atrium building, the first modern office building. Uh, this is the Bradbury building in Los Angeles, in my view, a far better building, simply because of what it does. Is it makes the, No one knows what goes on around that kind of enlivened public promenade, but that, that is the memorable part. The, the edges can be endlessly changed. How people work, how people live in this building doesn't matter. This is the street within a building that we aspire to. Uh, Again, come back to this conversation about art and programme and longevity and change. When we work with governments on government buildings, the one thing we know is they're going to be vandalised. So here um, in London, we are working with a Dutch artist called Milu uh, van Han, who works with lettering, and an English architect called Jackie Ponsolet. And the idea was to create an architecture that was powerful enough to eradicate our national health services immediate potential to turn any building into the most miserable machine for bad signage. So, as I said earlier, to us, uh, the four of us and, and, and the team that's kind of grown around our conversation over the last 30 years, we've always been involved in teaching um, in the UK and abroad, and there are still units in London schools being run by people in our office, not ours, we've kind of retired from that aspect of, of the world. But to us, it's always about buildings having to have an idea that's robust enough to last the process of design and delivery. Because I talked earlier about the idea that um, you know, when we finish, the life of a building starts. There's also a point that when we win a project, when we win a competition, when we win a commission, the likelihood is our client and their needs will change during the life of the building. So how do we make a coherent architecture that might not be built and used for seven or eight years survive that process? And to us, it's about an I constructing an idea, both in reality, in that we want to build it out, um, but also constructing an idea that is clever enough to recognise that those attacks, those changes, that, that dynamic is not something to be feared, it's something to be embraced. And if you create a, a clever enough building with the right idea of tight fit and loose fit, it will accommodate change during the design process. And if it can accommodate it during the design process, it will accommodate it afterwards. And uh, so making is important. We have a dozen uh, model makers. They, they flew over last week, two of them, and assembled the exhibition. But making is becoming an increasingly important part of how we're thinking and getting involved and researching it into the making and indeed into the contracts. You know, there's an architectural thing about not being interested in contract, but actually the contract is one of the greatest controls of what you do and how it's done. So you can design the most wonderful building, but if you have the wrong contract, it's probably as bad as having the wrong builder. My partner in the front, Jonathan Hall, deals with that particular challenge on a daily basis. Um, this is really just about this idea of change. So 15, 20 years ago, when the internet was becoming kind of publicly uh, thought about and discussed, there was this idea that we would no longer uh, need to travel we would no longer need to assemble in cities. In fact, quite the opposite has happened. Um, social contact, Google for whom we work with, everyone in their office has a desk. Because actually bringing people together to talk in a different way to the way they talk through emails is incredibly important because emails have taken that chance conversation out of life. So there's the city streets are about chance conversations. That uh, Osbert Lancaster thing is about chance conversations. And so there's a, there's a danger that the, the medium of communication is actually uh, doing more damage and causing more problems than anyone currently realizes. I think we're the first generation 
or so to be using this kind of communication. And of course the trouble is, particularly if you're English, you walk into a room, you don't know anyone, you immediately look at your phone so you can avoid the embarrassment of having a conversation. So uh, when we work with these kind of companies like Google, there's a big conversation about new ways of working. And this is Hogarth's vision of uh, the gentleman of the city of London um, doing business uh, in 1770. In a way, it's not dissimilar to the image of the you know, internet business now. It's a kind of organized chaos built around food and drink. Um, this, is, this is Petra, and then this is, the, this, in a way, the, the rocks don't matter, it's the voids. What are the, what are the voids in the city? They're the spaces on Dolly's plan. What are the voids in our building? You know, they, they are the core, going back to that image of the Bradbury building, that will allow a building to last over time. London's often said not to be a design city, it's where we build most of our buildings. And what's interesting about London, it is a design city, there's about seven or eight design cities, and within each one there's about seven or eight different estates. And in, a, in the modern world, despite it, many failings and, and challenges it faces, what's interesting about London is that it's the difference in the grain, the changing in the structure, and the collisions and incidents that make it a rich city. It obviously has a history of trading, but I think there's something in the physical structure of the, built, of the city that allows it to kind of um, draw in people from around the world. And this was a kind of collage we produced, really to challenge this idea of, in England, we get told, well, that's a retail use, that's a, that's a residential use, that's an office use, that's an educational use. Within each use, there's seven or eight different cat categories. What we were saying is simply there's one use, it's, it's space to be inhabited by people in ways um, over time that we don't yet know. And this was a drawing we produced to kind of summarize that idea. It's theatre, stage, set and props. And it's really talking about time in architecture and change. Um, so if a building is a theatre, it will last 100 years. That is the core essence of the building. If it lasts 100 years, it can last 1,000 years. Uh, the stage sets, in a way, these are the elements of the building that might have a 5, 10, 15 year lifespan. And then the props are the elements of furniture, uh, buildings within buildings that can be endlessly reconfigured and that's kind of important to our thinking about the universal building because to us we know our buildings are be subject to change it's not something to be upset about if a building's been changed over time by its users a bit like uh, building 20 in Stuart Brand's How Building Learn at MIT if a building can be changed that is a successful piece of architecture um, a lot's been said about Le Corbusier and Pessac and the failing of uh, that, that residential development. But in fact, the fact that people adapted it, changed it, and lived in it in a different way is actually a success. And as Luca Busier himself said, life is always right. And that's a maxim we've taken through. And of course, um, this is a theatre building itself that we're working at the moment. And I show that because uh, what's interesting is it's a reconfigurable 20th century, 21st century theatre in central London with seven different configurations. But all the time our client is talking to us about personality character. She doesn't want a black box. She wants a memorable, glamorous venue. So again, it's always this idea that, that buildings have an emotional um, capacity that's hugely important. Uh, this is really kind of a slide that I often used to talk about Cedric Price, who's thinking about architecture, has always been important to the way we, we, we've discussed it and talked about ordinary buildings having extraordinary potential. And uh, you know, one of his great quotes was, it's not, a, it's not about designing bridges, it's about working out how best to get to the other side. And I think that's, in a sense, what we've been trying to do for the last 20, 30 years, is get to the other side of the conversation about a project. And actually now we're in a position where we've and either revisiting buildings to help remake them, our own buildings, or indeed we've never left a building because you know, the, the life of a building would be quite dynamic. So early projects, obviously that's a context that the exhibition talks about and this slideshow is, is in the uh, draped room at the back. But our first project was a kind of the classic problem of a freestanding uh, building in the gardens of some clients who happened to be my parents not unusual commission for, for four young architects. Um, they bought themselves two presents when they retired. 
One was a, a painting uh, by Le Corbusier, and the other was a, a swimming pool house to sit in the gardens of the house that my father designed in the 60s. And when someone said to him, I, I didn't know you liked swimming, he said, no, but I like architecture. So his present was a painting and a piece of architecture. And our solution, in a sense, because of the freedoms we had, was to make a very, very constrained building. We talked about barns, we talked about caskets, we found an image of Queen Victoria's bathing hut, and we liked the idea that this was, was a very, very restrained object that gave nothing away except its windows were on the floor, because that's where you looked when you swam. Um, and and the, the clues into the program were there. What's quite interesting about this tension between the specific and the generic is I've now removed the pool and turned it into a living room and the windows are still on the floor. Um, but it kind of works. And then this is just the idea of connection between life and sport and architecture and painting. Uh, this was another big competition we won in our early stages, like the bus station, a key project, again in the Midlands. This was about building low-cost housing for rent for a charity that was researching into um, new models for low-cost affordable housing, exactly the kind of thing we talk about now, in a very tough run-down part of Birmingham, our second city. And then the idea here was to take, a simple, simple idea, was to take the streets in the sky, beloved of the 60s, open up the corridor, pull it apart, and create a kind of dynamic public room that allowed light to come into apartments from both sides and kind of turn the streets into a kind of multi-layered courtyard. So it was a critique of post-war housing. Uh, this was a school, in, again a bit like the pool house, in the middle of a nowhere place, in the middle of, um, sort of middle England. And here the idea was, if you have no context, you need to make a powerful form within the landscape. And, knowing how dynamic schools were having refurbished some, we developed this idea of a plimsoll line that anchors the building to its landscape, this black line, but also allows us, during the course of the design process, with the client who can't make their mind up, to endlessly cut windows into the elevation. It's the opposite of the pool house where everything was defined and distinct. Here, anywhere in that black line, you can create uh, fenestration to allow for the kind of change during design. And that change during the design process has you know, become a key part of the discussion you know, about how we make buildings work, how they can flex over time, how we can play with scale, how we can make connection, um, how we can challenge pedagogical models. They wanted an open plan school. At the same time, we were actually putting walls into open plan schools to cellularize them. And then this idea about actually life taking over a building. So I returned to the bus station, which was a kind of key project to us. Um, the brief was uh, 18 bus islands. Our you know, reinvention of the brief, as that idea about strategic design, was to create a single uh, 90 metre by 60 metre elliptical concrete roof that defined a new place, a new civic space, and to, that condensing of the bus traffic to one place allowed us to create a new public square. Tim Saw, who's taken all the photographs, um, revisited that building recently. There it is in the city. So you see the elliptical roof, which actually curves the edge. It's on a two kilometre uh, radius, so it's a kind of highly complex, bespoke concrete form. And then the new square onto the church, which in our uh, changing world is actually a, a, a Church of England retail operation. Um, and then this idea about special places for ordinary people. Um, and then again the idea of the abuse of art. When Tim went back, Alex Hartley and Tanya Kovacs, two quite eminent artists, produced a series of kind of Morse code-like patterns that the station management team have painted blue. And then here you get the idea of actually the building in the city being greenness, being a powerful physical form, a canopy floating to kind of create a covered outdoor room, the idea of, of, of the grand steps taking you up to it, dealing with level change, and the idea of life and incident. This, by contrast, goes back to that idea of uh, a robust, simple organisational thing. This is a backland site in central London, accessed through a hole in a wall, with no elevational outlook, so it becomes a courtyard wrapped in a simple 
are currently used as a kind of workplace office, carved out of, carved out of the city. And again, this idea of, of not everything is public, this is a secret space, and just kind of being reconsidered and thought about in different ways. In, again, as part of the housing debate, we were asked to look at modular construction. Uh, there's a great fantasy going on still in the UK, I'm sure elsewhere, about the benefits of modular construction. This only highlighted to us the kind of fact that something's made in a factory doesn't make it any good um, as a piece of construction, but it was successful as a piece of architecture. Um, these were simple, large modules. It developed a different plan type, so the constraint of prefabricated uh, boxes uh, made 200 miles away and assembled forced us to think differently about how we organised services, how we sacked departments, how we created access systems, how we slid blocks to create um, sort of secondary public space of primary public space, and how the life of the user is, is vital in taking over the life and making the life of the building. And then here, kind of essential language about uh, outdoor rooms in high level apartments, creating gardens in the sky, and then that kind of tough London juxtaposition. This is a project we've been working on for 17 years, it's never stopped. It's a 400,000 square foot warehouse right in the middle of Shoreditch. Um, it began as a let's kind of uh, put an art gallery in there and do up one floor. It's now one of the most successful creative industry kind of hubs in London. It's not our building, we're just the latest people to play with it. We've remade it three or four times internally. It's a basic street with shipping containers to kind of guide and, and monitor movement. There's an art program that runs through it. We're doing as little as possible to make it work we're allowing the bones of the building to come through. And part of the reason I show this is because actually this same client is commissioning new buildings from us, the last one I'll show, the White Collar Factory, which have really learnt from this historical building and its reuse, that we need to make a more generous, more intelligent and more particular architecture. Um, and then, of course, again, in this program, they have a program of art, they have a number of art galleries there, and that is the whole building is, is a curated space where you discover art um, within each building within the building, and you discover chaos, and a restaurant, and swimming on the roof. So it's kind of, even in London, we get uh, hot days. Um, this is the Barbican, part of the Brave New World, to which we're quite closely connected in terms of people who taught us, people we know now. But the idea of the Barbican that was that everyone would access this amazing new development, either by car from the basement or from a bridge on the first floor, and no one would be walking on the streets. It was a kind of magnificently heroic folly. And our job has been to actually kind of redress uh, those problems while recognising the essential brutalist quality of the building, its strength. So we're, we're kind of com completing the next stage of the use of that project. So we're making entrances where trucks used to go. Uh, we're working with the same artist who we worked with at Walsall to kind of use art as a, as a kinetic piece that guides you in. We're inserting new structures and, and the basic competition winning strategy was to actually remove choice. It was a classic 60s idea that people could go anywhere and do anything. Again, going back to that constraint, and because of that, no one knew where to go. So we actually kind of limited choice, created a route, so like a street, you picked up choices on your way, rather than being told you can do whatever you like in this building. And it was a play of inserting new bridges, and then enhancing old structures, and researching the history of the building, and how we could work with it utilising it, reconnecting it, make an art gallery that was a walk-through space. So again, making rooms, city rooms within the building. And also, again, as a nice contrast to the Saatchi Gallery, this idea that there's a fascination now for white box uh, hanging of art, which everyone gets very excited about. And actually, any, anything looks pretty good, which is why we put a small amount of work on the walls next door if you have enough white wall around it. But of course the reality of, of these things is there's new uses coming in, there's a cinema shop. And here is a kind of interesting idea. This is Dorothy Anand's art 
uh, from a telecommunications mural done in the 60s or late 50s all about this brave new world that we think we're the first people to be living in now taken from the street and put in the high lines of the Barbican. Uh, this is Liverpool, the first two tall buildings we designed and there was this idea about urban camouflage, about dazzle ships, about placing these, historical, these buildings in this historical context, the two live uh, buildings in Paul Monon's home city, so the challenge to sort of how to make them have a profile, um, have an impact upon the sky, yet grow out of the city, and a pattern making that referenced both this kind of vorticist art of uh, the First World War, where these ships were being played with and actually painted by some great artists like William Roberts, to actually um, camouflage them, that could we develop an architectural idea that juxtaposed uh, formal arrangements of interlocking flats um, and balconies to kind of communicate the life of both the office and the residential within, and reference back to Giles Gilbert Scott, who did the original um, Tate Modern power station, referencing back some of these details within the historical architecture, and then here from city centre. Adelaide Wharf was a different kind of prototype. Again, learning from your own projects is incredibly important to us. So what we learned from Modular was that actually a much better building large, simple concrete frames and then prefabricating uh, the, the small complex areas of a building such as a bathroom or a kitchen. And again, with a nod to the kind of brave new world of the post-war Britain, um, bringing art into social housing. This is a local artist, Richard Woods, who's gone on to have a, you know, quite a stellar career um, with an interest in, in actually his art being the kind of background to the everyday life. And the building itself, sitting on a canal side, a park, and a busy street, is a kind of a complete reinvention of how you built housing, lightweight facades made in Czechoslovakia, we're hanging all the balconies off, off jibs on the roof to put no pressure onto the facades, we're creating balconies two or three times the size of the brief, and we're redistributing money from one place to another to try and make an architecture that was both of its place, but had a generosity and scale. Um, and had its own kind of artistic uh, colour, program of colour as marker. And where this kind of U-shaped building compresses at corners, you get tight entries. And this is private space for the people who live here, but this is a new kind of development in program as well. It's houses for sale, houses for rent, and houses for social rent. But in the end, going back to this idea of the universal, they're just houses for people. And here you see this idea of interior, detail, simple quality, how you get out from your, 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 your apartment into the city, how you create shared communal space between the community of users, how actually the building is private, because th there are private places in the city, there are private courtyards and vents, gates, but it opens up. And I like this image because it was used in a film by uh, Julie Walters and... Um, Dustin Hoffman, which is a story about a love affair over these rather large balconies with him dropping tortoises um, from one level to another. Um, an interesting idea when architecture becomes kind of the setting for filmmaking. And of course there's another view of architecture um, that we don't use in a photograph, which is that kind of the random glimpse, the, you know, the non-composed image, and a continuous awareness of that is very important. Um, Again, talking about art galleries, this is the yellow building, it's for a fashion uh, uh, magnet, entrepreneur. It's the third building we'd done for him, we'd reworked an old building. We knew he, he, he didn't mind robustness, he didn't mind motorways, he didn't mind a tough building. We knew he was a cha chaotic creative organisation. So the building is a kind of, it's called the yellow building, it's a landmark uh, crossing in, in the edge of West London. And then internally, it's the idea is we've stripped all the architecture out. We've been designing a city room for another client that had become a very complex, successful, but complex essay in architectural composition. And here our aim was if we make a lower cost building, and again the problem, the challenge, the opportunity of constraint, we've stripped all the architecture out and worked only in the idea that if we pulled all the, all the surfacing out of the building, all the, all the shear walls out of the building, created a kind of dense wall of, of, of a service wall to the south to take out the, the solar load, because we're quite exposed site, then actually 
a, we, had, we had a problem with rigidity and that we could use a three-dimensional uh, grid to give us simple handmade concrete formwork, a grid that is the background for a remarkable collection of art he has. And art to him is not something, it goes back to the idea of the artist's studio, art is not something you place in a gallery. This is a Carsten Holler. Um, the last thing was uh, Kim Sujo's City on the Run. Art is something you, you place within the building. Uh, there's a, there's a, uh, a Feely, a Boetti. It's art is something you place in the building to have a conversation with the people within the building. It's not something you, you send them to. It's not something they, they see in the art gallery in the building. It's an inherent part of the visual culture of his business. Um, and, and the space can then be appropriated by the, by, by the occupants and by the artists. Uh, this is a school, uh, a, you know, again, a, a kind of a public sector school in a tough part of London, uh, a very kind of uh, brutal housing estate, uh, not far from you know, the Grenfell estate, so one of those kind of tough uh, 60s uh, area of tower blocks and blight, very multicultural area, and this is the idea of, 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 of a school as a much more permanent uh, contrast to the grey world around using um, ancient techniques, so this is kind of glazed uh, terracottas fired so that we know we won't suffer from fading and this becomes a kind of a, a backdrop to, to the kind of brutal world around and, and it changes its colour in the light in different ways so it's a, it's a, it's a smooth box for inhabiting and then there's a sports facility which is in the gardens which is much more of a community use that kind of contrasts with the educational building they see it in a more green setting and then this idea of, of, of a new 21st century multicultural London school where 57 languages are spoken they're running the international baccalaureate it's a different kind of uh, place to be and there was an interesting discussion with the head teacher about security to make the school feel as open as she could, she's made it very secure at the entrances, which contrasts with the idea of the school as a public building. Um, but in a difficult area, there's this idea, well, actually, if you have secure edges, you can then allow a school to be free within. And, and actually, obviously, as the area changes, the school can change over time, but architecture can't solve those problems, but it can at least enable a different discussion and create a kind of network of movement, this promenade, very much like the Bradbury building, where the random chance encounters of, of school students in a more positive way, the fact there's teaching spaces off there, the fact they're engaged as a community rather than cellularised and cut off, and the fact they're continuously looking to each other's classes and learning, and that every detail of the architecture has been considered by the architect to make spaces that make them feel that they're being treated as kind of future citizens rather than people to be educated um, and controlled. This is Alan Bennett, a famous playwright. Normally when we make buildings people try and stop us doing it and they protest. In his case he stood up at the planning meeting and sort of <laughs> condemned the protesters and demanded the building got consent. It still took uh, seven or eight years that uh, Paul was leading this project to get this thing through and built. And it only came off because there was a, a doctor who championed the idea of a better model of making a building he wanted, not a building that did a job for him. And that's the kind of problem you get with architecture being driven down from the top by government. It needs to be driven up from uh, the potential users. And his idea was very much to rethink the programme, to keep a multi-layered, mixed-use building focused on healthcare, but with three or 400 people working there, and to kind of get rid of the idea of hospital and make local health really important. And as part of that, it was the kind of the setting of the building. It's, it's you know, retaining listed trees, but kind of bringing a graphic artist, uh, Studio Myerskoff, into the interior to kind of open up views and glimpses. So although you know, it, it's a healthcare building, there are different departments within it, they're quite kind of strict divisions of, of management. The building has a social program, visual connection is made, communication is easy, and actually, you could, always, you could open the window and talk to someone below. Actually, architecture can kind of enable different kinds of social interaction, much better than picking up the phone. Much, and then it, art is an embedded part of the project with a changing art collection within it. 
And then this idea of actually the abstraction of the city becomes almost a kind of art piece in its own right. Uh, the Saatchi Gallery I show because it's uh, interesting that the client said, uh, I, I'm in a listed building, I never want to be in a listed building, I want to find an old warehouse. So we looked for four years and then we found him a listed building. This is the building that had already changed function four times, it was about to be an office. It's, in many ways, it, it counteracts uh, some of the current models because it is all art gallery and no uh, circulation. The art gallery is the circulation. It, there it is, it's an 1820 uh, Duke of York headquarters, a uh, classical building. That's the only uh, vertical circulation within the building. And then the rest of the movement is through the galleries. It's also a very good illustration of, in white space, whatever you're producing looks rather handsome. And actually it's one of the simplest jobs you've ever done. It's the kind of, I don't think there's much adventure going on in the art world in terms of how you position work. It is generally in white cube space, which is why we enjoyed the Barbican with its kind of more, more brutalist interior. It obviously gives a neutral backdrop, which is useful to someone like Charles who is a kind of collector stroke dealer, but there is an idea that the space is, you know, perhaps too generically art gallery anywhere um, in the world. And of course at the top, he's re we're really recreating his original art gallery, which is an old garage. And then at the bottom, interestingly enough, Richard Wilson's famous oil piece, the art is flexible enough to be just reconfigured to find the new room. It wasn't it that the art piece um, was very much to fill a space, and if you change the space, as we did here, the art piece changes to respond to the city. So not in a sense, unlike our theory of, of kind of uh, the ability of buildings to respond to program. This is the Angel Building, where we recycle the building. This is a place for work, where we most successfully in any private building, it's a multi-let office building, created the idea of public room, um, and then, again, the idea of art as background, the client's a big collector, this is Teresita Fernandez, the art world's even more commercial than the architecture world. We flew to the Lima and Mopan Gallery twice to discuss this specially commissioned piece. They said to us, you can have one for 250,000 or two for 400. Um, so it's art by the yard, um, but, but quite an elegant piece in its own right. And then there's this other idea of uh, photography by younger artists positioned within it as, again, the background to the life of the building. And then there's actually a, a piece called um, Out of the Thick, which is a, an architectural design piece, not by ours. And again, the building is the receptacle into which um, the life of the users, people, art, life, the life of the office, the life of London, the engagement with London, and then again, the creation of a, of a public room on the roof. Uh, celebrating its situation high up, you know, high up on, a, on, on this kind of uh, valley, the basin that is London. This, by contrast, is a much tougher part of London to the east. This is really about four buildings and a public function and a long gestation to make a new place where they were essentially pulling down uh, the brave new world and trying to build a, a different new world. So there's a, there's a, there's a programme for Mature Garden there's a programme for a library. Here you get this idea of a connection to London, but it's a place that sort of time forgot. It was once, um, it's barking, it was once a big fishing port, but it's become a kind of, uh, it's our version of the peripherique. It's a kind of edge place. But brave things are going on there to try and in invent that edge space in a way you can't do in an established place like London. And there's an idea of saturated colour because it was such, it, it's the world, it was the world of, of, of uh, brutalism and clockwork orange. And then here, across our own language, the actual increasing use of masonry, brick as a material that we know will age well, but it's a counterpoint to these dancing balconies. And then again, coming back to this idea of the buildings in the background to the space in between, and then the idea internally of that stage set, that 20 year program for library and how actually kind of public facilities need to kind of uh, open up and bring in the relevant audience around them and embarking. This is not an audience who would normally engage um, with the kind of the life of culture. This is actually about a place where people 
a hospice where people go who are terminally ill. And the greatest challenge here was to make a super-scaled home, people living here for four, six, eight, ten weeks, a few months before they die. The two challenges was super-scaled idea of home, plus again, as with that Milo Van Han art project um, earlier with the childcare centre, to make buildings where actually the interior could feel like home and not have that over-cleansed military hospital feel. So part of the battle was architectural, um, Another part of the battle was actually bringing the exterior into the interior and deinstitutionalizing these buildings, creating a domestic uh, garden, but then allowing kind of the, the passage um, from life to death to become a kind of domestic one rather than over-designed, top-down, uh, government-run institutional world. So it's a place for people to live as they might do at home. Interestingly, it's all these people allowed us to be, to be photographed, um, despite kind of current concerns people have about that kind of thing. This building in the exhibition is really about the idea of what do you do when there is no context. In 2004, we were asked to design a school for a master plan. The simple idea we had was, if there is no context, there was no place, there was no people, and no housing, we needed, a, going back to that Nolly plan idea, we needed a memorable uh, form. So we, we devised this idea of a circle to sit as the focus of a public route. The project then became the Olympic Village. 6,000 homes were built. But when we were designing this school, there's the Olympic Village. You see this kind of heavy uh, development, a park down the middle by the Swiss landscape architects Vought. The idea of uniformity was created um, with the idea of a precast language. And then the, at the end, at the head of the park, is this public building that both faces down the park and then faces the older London, the poor you know, London of Stratford to, to, to the north. This idea of connection, sports facilities, bridge, detail, and the building has its own nostrils because in our over-regulated world, go back to Gilray's image, actually there's a kind of traffic noise issue. We wanted a naturally ventilated school, we weren't allowed, so the nostrils are a kind of cleaning device to allow natural air to come into the building, but through an acoustic um, and an environmental buffer. And then the building is all about a hard edge um, to the square at the front and a soft edge to the gardens to the rear. A hard edge to the public corner, a public canopy, shared uses, a kind of reference the idea of, of breaking up the circular element within to try and make the circle more legible with a series of um, inverted forms that break it up. The idea of the journey of the kids through the school being very simple, um, but again looking out the city and letting the city come in. And then this idea of a social space at the bottom for the children of different ages to take in different ways. And it was an all age academy, so children from 3 to 18. The idea that we know that the architecture has had the strength to both encourage and accommodate you know, the life of the school and to become its backdrop. And in a way, it's a sort of similar essay in architecture as backdrop to life as, say, the yellow building. And actually, increasing for us, again, this idea of the, the landscape as the defining characteristic of, of the kind of social space of the school. It's the landscape in this project that actually kind of brings the school um, to life. We wouldn't be allowed to show photographs of children anymore. Um, and then this is the Olympic condition. And then this idea of this core end bridge, which is a little technical essay in the project about, about a long span structure that, whose cords are expressing and whose dimensions are expressing the structural load. Um, this is the University of Amsterdam, which is a project where, again, we're reusing a building. When we won the competition, we had one simple strategy to reconnect the building to the city by removing a large chunk. Um, because it sat on a canal and had killed the, the hinterland behind and disconnected uh, town from gown. Um, and we, we also were quite clear in the interview that uh, no one from the university would be there at the end. Whatever their programme was, it would have changed across the ten years it's taken to build it. Um, it's built, it's open, there are 6,000 students uh, uh, studying there, 1,000 academics, this is a Barbara Brookman piece. Here you see the building of the city. It's very much an existing frame cut and played with, where, again, this idea of city rooms 
is expressed throughout the architecture. So you, you can actually kind of see through the building, you can see into the building, and you can see the social space of the building, such as this, which is underneath the bridge. And when you're in the building from being in kind of dense, uninhabited structure, it's now engaging with the city. And wherever you are, you're getting this kind of multi-layered connection to spaces beyond. And this, which is the kind of space of, of uh, teaching and learning, is really the background space to the public space of the building. And it's these mini atria that gather people around in, in, in vertical stacks that stops it being a million square foot of anonymous space and starts to build this idea of incidental um, character for the life of Aquedeen. And then there's uh, 2,000 student lecture halls, which are almost objects. Again, these are the stage sets docked within the bigger shell of the building because we know they will be reconfigured over time. So these are buildings within buildings. In terms of working somewhere like the West End, this is Regent Street. Um, really, making a building is a series of incidents. This is Rona Smith, the artist. This is Gates. This is a reference to watchmaking. This is Alison Wilding from the Royal Academy. How her art, called Shimmy, was a piece that she's reinvented to react to the architecture that she found within the building. So she was commissioned during the design of the building. And then this idea of actually bringing green into the city. Here, working with Keith Tyson, the um, Turner Prize artist, putting these buildings and art within the city, and the detail of the craft of making, and the technology of a triple skin facade reflecting the city and reflecting the sky. And then again, this idea of constructing the architecture, of making the details, of making everything work. And then again, this reference back to the history, the Bestigio apartments, and kind of the, 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 the surrealist uh, landscape of the roof of London. Just coming to the end now, this is Burntwood School that um, won the uh, Sterling Prize. A very constrained project, uh, a, a girls' school with a very uh, active and powerful kind of head teacher, and the balancing between her vision and engagement with the contractor, a way of making and a way of building a project where we actually have to keep the school open throughout demolish uh, four or five buildings and build five or six new buildings. So incredibly constrained, and I have no doubt the success of the project is because of the constraint. The cheapness of construction leads to this deep uh, concrete reveal that can be rotated to make a play of light and form with an obvious reference uh, to Marcel Breuer. The idea that each building is a pavilion where the facade is the visage, um, but yeah, a dancing kind of play in the city and then these, again these cuts through this reference to the permanent elements, the promenade through the building, the using of, of off-the-shelf components so that the walkway is a bus shelter adapted. So everything is kind of working hard uh, to do more than one thing. And then how the old building, the distance, and the new building start to set up a relationship and then the new building is reflected in the new building and the old building. And then this idea about attention to detail, about visual delight, about stimulation. The kids aren't looking at architecture, but it's there in the background to their life, and how architecture is kind of capturing its setting in the sky. And then internally, how actually the set piece spaces within this can be cut away and eroded regardless of the visage, it's not expressed. So where, where spaces need to be created in this very, very simple, uh, robust uh, design, uh, there's detail, there's an engagement with the same graphic artists we work with at the Kentish Town Building. But then there's incidents for life to go on. And then here you get the idea of a triple height uh, kind of breakout art space. But again, it, the fact is that there's a disconnect between the interior and exterior. Is in fact the strength of, of, of the kind of universal idea of program. And then again, this idea about embedding art, in this case, a graphic design art, within the kind of the name of the building, the numbering of the building, um, the entrance of the building, the route, and then here in a more uh, applied way on the walls. Um, in America, we were asked to design a, a million square foot campus for a client. Um, his, his, his first and only commission, because tragically he died, was to take a, a redundant concrete slab he'd built and build a sports centre. The original building was to house 100,000 bottles of wine for his private collection. I said to him that seemed a bit excessive. He said, yes, he was embarrassed. You only need 15,000 bottles, so there you go. Um, but this was the most generic 
of buildings. This is the most obviously universal building. It's a hangar, it's a, it's a shed, it's a sports building, it's functional, it's in the prairies in America, it allows things to happen, it uses off-the-shelf components, it's carefully detailed, light comes down to the basement, it's a basketball court, um, now it's we're just converting it two years into its use into the center for the Oklahoma Ballet. But the interesting thing is, although this is a universally kind of familiar uh, form, it's actually no more generic or universal than any of the other projects we've shown you. It's always just the architectural expression of that idea. Um, just kind of again, this idea about old and new and placing buildings. This is an old building, a library, with a new, you know, in, in a kind of, uh, emerging, regenerating part of, of West London about placing kind of a careful interest in polychromatic brickwork, about kind of hard edge detailing to the street, about uh, colour through architecture the rather than applied, getting back to a kind of essential material idea, and then how that runs through into the interior, breaking down that, that idea of sort of the outside being a fix and the inside being um, kind of contemporary. And then this idea of actually how that has come through in the architecture, how the detailing comes through, how the spatial arrangement and the overlooking, the engagement, going back to Kentish Town Health Centre, this idea of looking out, looking through, um, across, down. So again, this idea that actually architecture can't create a social space, but it can allow a feeling that kind of helps, him, uh, helps harness kind of a, a sense of community. And then their kind of slogan for the building is an art piece. Uh, this was a project with about work and live, and again, this idea of referencing back to previous project. We worked here with Martin Richmond, the artist, an old friend of ours, 20,000 pieces of glass suspended in space, animating this street, exploiting the kind of simplicity of the architecture as an engagement from the start. And in a sense, this is probably the most embedded and integral design. It has its own space to be, but it's very much part of the thinking behind the building that the plainness of the material language would be offset and enhanced by the artistic program. And then how revisiting the Casper idea 15 years on, the residential component, the glimpse through to it, has become a new idea of the street and the sky. So again, kind of uh, transferring ideas from one project to another over time. Uh, Google we show because in a sense we don't, we're not particularly interested in the making of office interiors, but here was the idea to, t to strip a, a new building that had never been used back to its frame and create the most obvious and powerful promenade, which is a series of bridges and staircases that take a, a corporate atrium and actually transform it into a kind of stage set for, for their life, for their occupation, and within it to develop a simple idea like a Lego brick of plywood that meant they can literally reconfigure whole floors within a day or two using simple robust technology. So it's almost the innovation is in the simplicity of it and you don't need specialists to make, to make or remake your spaces within it. These uh, 2.4 by 600 panels can be endlessly reused and endlessly kind of repurposed and be ordered on a very large scale or a very small scale. So it's this idea about architecture within architecture and systems um, which we call Jack, um, which is kind of the, the project code name. The idea of actually kind of the furniture, everything is part of the Jack project, which is a reconfigurable, reusable 21st century office space, kind of Google growing up and actually making spaces that, that can actually do what they talk about rather than look like an idea of what they might be. And again, the importance of this idea about the relationship to the city. And then, of course, they couldn't resist having their ridiculous sleeping pods um, which I don't think anyone uses. Um, and then going back to that image from Hogarth, all they do in these tech companies is eat and drink. That's what most of the people spend their time doing. Um, this is a kind of the most subtle intervention, an existing Art Deco theatre, and the idea of actually new elements giving it a public lobby it never had, addressing a street, almost referencing, perhaps consciously or subconsciously, um, Edmund Hopper's work, and this idea of kind of the core 10 inserts being very legible. So our intervention, like Jack, is a kind of visible piece. And then stripping the back to its raw nature, which again comes back to this idea now of saying to clients, 
let's, let's not finish buildings, let's leave them as a raw piece. Um, in this case, it, it's stripping it back to its rawness, but now in a new build, we say a kind of similar way of thinking about that idea about the city, a connection to the city, and rawness. So the last two projects, New Scotland Yard is in a sense a good example of uh, a building designed for the Metropolitan Police. Um, what is, uh, the, the building is, is, is the kind of very set piece thing, untouchable, and yet it's been completely reworked. And it kind of to the left is um, Norman Shaw's work, and then you know this is the kind of the, the 30s classical piece that we then have to remake considerably, and then insert a series of new architectural pieces, bomb-proof entrance canopy, public rooms. So the most bomb-proof is the most um, kind of uh, public element within it. A new element on top details Robert Peel within a kind of vitrine to the rear. This kind of idea of the history of London being kind of played back through the building. The idea that actually this building is open to the public, engaging with them. And then this idea of the eternal frame, flame. And then, of course, the tragedy of this building was it, it's, it was opening on, on, on the first day of, a, of the first of the London terrorist attacks. And then a, a simple humorous idea about uh, interior, detail, police cars. An idea that actually, why not have some fun in the elements that might change? And there you get the idea of the old courtyard, the infilled new insert, the repaired corner, um, the idea of this attention to detail reflecting back the colours of the buildings around it, of how the new and old can sit and work together, how an office for the Metropolitan Police is not that different to an office for Google, how actually the tension and the politics of being in such a charged building, such a secure building, next to um, the seat of power in the UK kind of adds, adds a free song to how you make the architecture and how it's perceived. And so finally ending, this is the, this come back to this idea about longevity. This club we've worked with for 25 years. Uh, we did the angel building with them, we did the T building. And, and the interim conclusion of that inquiry has been actually, can we make a building with no finishes as a pure expression of making? Um, and this was the kind of marketing idea, which was to kind of talk about a low energy naturally ventilated office building. It's just finishing now. There are six buildings built around a new public space. Um, it's about uh, new kinds of ways of working, and the architecture is a kind of background for what's called Silicon Roundabout in central London. And then again, you get this idea of uh, the industrialized machine and the craft and the making of the building reflecting the historical um, craft and making of buildings in London. And of course, we are in a contrast of scale, and detail, and the kind of ad hoc nature of our less planned areas. So these are the streets um, that, that are still looking to be defined and reconstructed. And then this idea of actually revisiting the brutalism which we, we've been kind of repairing and bringing that into the architecture. So internally, there are no finishes. Reception desks are actually mechanical hoists that move around. Space is endlessly reconfigurable. Detailing is absolutely minimal and raw. Um, it's naturally ventilated, it's thermally massive, it builds on the work in the yellow building, it garners its architecture an idea of convergence out of everything that we're interested in doing, which is nothing is doing one thing, it's adding detail, it's shading the building, um, it's giving detail on the facade. There are moments where we create special kind of neighbourhoods and cuts and places in the city. And at the top, we create a club, a view of London, um, a, a place to escape from work that is communal to the building and the whole idea is that this building is open to the public. And then in the end there's a running track around the roof so the city's been elevated up to the roof. And for us in a way that you know as an ending slide is really about this idea of the journey. You could never quite see around the corner of where what you're doing is going to go, but you're constructing ideas that mean that as you get around that route in five years or ten years time when the building's built. Um, it has the kind of intelligence and the openness um, to absorb life. Thank you all very much.